Welcome everybody to this webinar on deliberate practice. We're grateful that you would join us both. We have people from all over the planet, really. I'm in the United States in Chicago. Daryl, you are down under in Perth. I know it's late at night there for you. Not too bad. It's 10 p.m., but I know some colleagues from the Eastern States and Melbourne, they are two hours ahead of me and some of them can be here, some of them a little bit late. And, you know, Scott, that's one of the reasons if we could ask permission for people that we record this for them too. Yeah, we'd really appreciate it because then we will edit and we'll make it available on the YouTube and podcast channels that we have. So let's move right on ahead and begin talking about deliberate practice and where this all starts. For more than five decades, the field after establishing its efficacy has attempted to improve the outcomes of clinical work. Most of that has taken a pretty familiar form and shape. We've codified our diagnostic nomenclature. We've refined that. We put out five volumes in the United States under the title of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. At the same time, the number of treatment approaches has rapidly expanded. Again, the assumption being that maybe if we find the right approach for the right problem, we would end up with better outcomes. But in point of fact, the outcomes have remained largely flat over the last 50 years. But there is one finding that stands out, Daryl, over and over again, generation to generation. Yeah, and you know what? The, the the thing that is seems really basic to say this now at this stage, but back when the research was coming out, you know, this was something of a controversy because the thing that's pretty outstanding is the fact that there are differences between therapist outcomes and time after time in various research has been done and the research that we've done as well. It's the differences accounting for client outcomes that's attributed to therapists is about five to nine percent and this was this was kind of interesting when when bruce wampole and his colleague would, were doing this because they found that before they started to look at therapist effects therapist effects were treated as error variance error variance which means that they were considered as noise in statistical terms until they decided to say well, hang on a second who is the treatment provider, if that's added to the analysis, seems to make the difference and then wash away the actual methodology or the school of thought that was employed. And this finding is consistent now, well established, and the differences between clinicians have really come into focus, as you say, Daryl, within the last 10 to 15 years unrelated to age and gender, caseload, theoretical orientation, social skills level, professional degree, I mean, all sorts of ways that we've tried to explain away that who the therapist is really matters. But how to understand that and utilize that has been a whole nother issue. If, if the performer really matters in terms of improving outcome, how do we fit that into the traditional medicalized view of psychological care, which is, the patient comes in, what matters about them is their diagnosis, and we apply the appropriate ameliorative treatment approach. And a person who really contributed a great deal to our understanding of individual performer effects is Anders Ericsson, a Swedish psychologist that most of you have probably heard about now, who had been laboring in the vineyard, so to speak, for decades and decades and had actually never been contacted by anyone in the field of mental health to ask how to understand therapist effects. Meanwhile, he'd studied top performers across a variety of domains in chess and music and art and science and found that in fact, some consistently rose to the top. And I'll just say that in our own research, using the ORS and SRS, the outcome and the session rating skills, this is something we'd struggled with because as therapists began to share their outcomes with us, we noticed that some consistently rose to the top. And Daryl, I'll say, I was one of those who thought this is just error variance. And like the stock market, one year your stock will be flying high as a therapist and the next year it would be down. But it was quite shocking to find that year on, 
and year out, therapists consistently performed at higher levels than other clinicians. Again, now a well-established finding. We have Jesse Owen uh, to thank for much of that. If you're really good with one client, you tend to be good across your clients. And Erickson had some ideas about how that happened. And maybe we should talk about that a bit, Daryl. Yeah, and you know, one, one of the things that we, as clinicians, we do need to spell out the differences is, it was sound, painfully obvious once I say it, but it's just worth making it clear. Clinical practice is not deliberate practice. Clinical practice is what we do within the box of the therapy room, within the confines of the four walls, within private practice in the agency setting, and we are uh, engaged to our best of ability to perform. But deliberate practice, on the other hand, is what happens outside of the box, so to speak. So it's things that happen before in terms of the preparation, in terms of what kind of inputs, how deeply you might engage in your personalized learning. We're going to talk a little bit about why this individualization is so key to, to the, the working definitions of deliberate practice and what you do after in terms of the work that you do. So how you might pull that into consolidation and reflection and then that loop would continue to cycle back and forth. So it's not just what happens within the session, but it's things that surround everything else. So it's kind of like, if you think about this in a performance analogy, clinical practice is, is what you do on stage, but deliberate practice is what you do backstage and off stage. And Daryl, I would say that here's the first crucial distinction of a couple that we're going to draw. When we use the word, I'm going to my clinical practice, or I did clinical practice this week, yeah. uh, in at least in American English, it leads to a lot of confusion because we have only one spelling for both practice, which is the type that you repeat over and over in attempt to master something, and practice, meaning a set of skills that you apply within a given setting. And as you say, that's not what we're talking about here. We should probably call what we do in the room with clients, as you just did, a clinical performance, and then distinguish between three different types of practice. And again, the reasoning here we think is critical, or the distinction is critical, mm -hmm. because right now, deliberate practice is a hot topic. There are books and trainings coming out on deliberate practice that conflate several different types of practice that Erickson identified. The one you're all here for today is deliberate practice. But Erickson, in his work, distinguished between two other types, one called naive, which is whenever you start a new activity, say learning to drive a car, you get in the car and you drive around, maybe with a teacher or a parent when you were younger, trying to just get the gist of what it's like to be behind that wheel of the car, so to speak. If you're doing your practicum, that's a kind of naive practice. The point here is that most people, according to Erickson, as soon as they achieved proficiency, they stopped doing anything really that improved their outcomes. The second type of practice he called purposeful, and this is something that we're seeing presently in much of the material that's coming out around called deliberate practice. Purposeful practice means that I'm going to work until I achieve competence with a particular skill. Once I achieve competence, I can move on to the next skill that I need to master. But that's not what deliberate practice is about. So if you see a book that says deliberate practice for CBT therapists, it's really rather an oxymoron. There, there, there can be no such thing. That is purposeful practice, but it's not really different from what we've done as a field, which is to focus on what happens inside the box rather than on the individual therapist part before and after. And I suppose that leads us to the definition of deliberate practice, which is the hours spent alone, seriously reaching for objectives just beyond your current ability. And this is the key, reaching for objectives beyond your individual ability, or in other words, to qualify as an instance of deliberate practice, whatever it is you're practicing has to be tied to improving your performance edge. And so that's what 
we talk about a great deal in the work that we're doing on deliberate practice. How do you find your edge, that zone of proximal development for you? If you just repeat what you already know, clinical practice, then you're in the realm of reliable performance where what you're really doing is recognizing and executing patterned behavior that's well established. If you're watching an expert execute some activity that you want to model, we call that the ambit of admiration. That's, that's what happens in a lot of workshops where you're really trying to emulate the behavior of somebody who's mastered the process. The problem is that for most beginners, and even for those of us who are trying to just push our performance to the next level, we can't really notice what is causal in the behavior of the person who's executing it. So the key here is to really find your performance edge. So in terms of the performance edge, this is why the individualization is so critical because like what Scott was mentioning about the distinctions of types of things that we can do to practice, when you are doing something that's even structured, maybe the, it, it may not be individualized because it would be just common core competence that you might have to do. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you are at the early phase of learning. Common cores may be uh, useful building blocks, but they don't speak to the specifications of what an individual may need to leverage and develop on. So the other, the other piece is that you want to make sure that you have feedback as you are applying what you've learned, right? But can you imagine that if you're practicing basketball and you're shooting, and as you're shooting, you're shooting past a veil and you don't know whether it goes in or not. I mean, in many ways, clinical practice without any kind of systematic way of organizing what you're doing, it's, it's, it's like shooting behind a veil, right? So you want to have what we call performance feedback, but you also want to have learning feedback. I mean, learning feedback is not just about whether how well you did. The learning feedback is about whether is this helping you towards your growth edge? Are the things that you are inputting, reading, listening, actually going to have mileage into translation? And then the third piece is that you want to have successive refinement. You're not just blindly repeating. And then this is why, you know, studies are showing now that clinical experience is not translating to improvement of outcomes. And I'm fond of saying that if somebody have 20 years of experience is actually uh, a one year of experience repeated 19 more times. So in some ways we end up doing what Ericsson calls automaticity. We just go into this kind of autopilot that we end up plateauing. This is why central to a deliberate practice piece out of every, all the three that have mentioned, the fourth pillar is that of a coach, somebody who can help you towards your growth edge, provide you the necessary feedback, tweak in your learning, and then help you make those refinements as you, as you go through the iterative process. With the pyramid in mind, we identify three basic steps to deliberate practice. If you want to find your performance edge, there is no escaping this. You have to measure in some reliable way, both your outcomes and the processes by which you achieve those outcomes. And for us, we've been using two simple tools that you can get for free on my homepage at scottdmiller.com called the ORS and the SRS. By routinely administering these, you can develop an evidence-based profile of both your strengths and your weaknesses. You may find, for example, that your relationship skills suffer with particular kinds of clients at particular times of day or with particular problems. That might be your performance edge. The second step in the process is to map your performance. The map here is to lay out in a step-by-step -step fashion how you work. And again, there's a method in the madness here. If you're going to tweak your performance, once you identify where the weaknesses are, you have to go to the map and make small changes and then test whether or not those changes resolve the problem or the deficit in your particular performance. That means creating a detailed picture, sufficiently detailed so that someone else could step into your place 
follow your map and replicate your work step for step with each client that you work with. And then the third step in this process is, as I said, make some small modifications with factors that have leverage over your performance. And we actually have a tool for that. It's called the TDPA or the, the Taxonomy of Deliberate Practice Activities. In brief, the TDPA is a deconstruction of what we do in the therapy hour from the beginning, middle and end, how we start, how we deepen, how we close. And this whole thing's, this whole thing's based on five key common factors, so to speak, on things that you can work on. And basically what it does, as you can see from the screen, is it's a worksheet that allows you to comb through in real systematic step-by-step -step way on how you do what you do, what Scott was mentioning about the map. And it's meant to help you zoom in on the top three things that you can work on. And then after the three things, even going down to specific things at one at a time, the priority to focus on. So you're going to find, measure your results, map your clinical work, and then you're going to modify by going through the TDPA, deconstructing your practice and looking where the weaknesses identified in your data map onto the factors that make a difference, those five factors Daryl mentioned. And in the process, there's a kind of a bit of guidance that we are giving for the first time in the new book, The Field Guide. One of the things that we found is that people that we work with, maybe perhaps also a selection bias, but many therapies that we come across, they are hungry to improve, to be of better help to the people that they're working with. And when you ask them, what is the outcome goal that you want to achieve? It's almost without skip, skipping a beat that most people would say, yeah, they want to improve their effectiveness, right? But we found that if you want to get down to any kind of meaningful deliberate practice, it has to be quite specific. So we broke, it, we broke this down into different processes that you can work with, and we call this the OPL. So O stands for outcome goal, P stands for process goal, and then L for learning project. So outcome goal basically is getting to the heart of what we're trying to do, and not just improve effectiveness in general. So specifications on the actual outcome, that they want to aim for, given what their data has said is so critical. And by the way, let me just sidestep a footnote here. This is why, you know, like Scott's, you know, your, your work and the ICCE's work about feedback informed treatment using measures is such an important foundation to have because when you don't have these pieces involved, it's almost like you don't have a scaffold or stage to build what you're trying to build. So having systematic routine ways of measuring outcomes it's such a vital piece to have then you can able you're able to look at the outcomes in very specific terms may i so add something you? there daryl please go so i was just thinking of how we traditionally do professional development there's mm. a workshop the topic is hot let's take trauma for example trauma is a hot and important topic right now in the field I guess the question is, is how do you know you need to adopt those skills? If, if you don't measure and look at your outcomes with your clients with that history already, you'll never know, number one, if you improve. So what you end up with is either naive or purposeful practice. I learn a particular technique and how to do it right until someone says, this is the right, this is the right thing. But think about this. If you simply adopt a new technique or strategy without knowing the outcome data, which Daryl's mentioning here, there is an equal risk that you will disrupt virtuous habits and cycles in your performance as there is the, as there is the promise that somehow your outcomes will improve. So I just want to underscore and say how important it is to have this measurement piece first. So I find what exactly do I need to work on? My apologies, Daryl. Not at all. And, and the measurement is not just about the quantification because you wouldn't say that speaking is about alphabets as well, right? I mean, it's not about numbers when you're measuring. It's just to give you 
a, a, a ability to recognize patterns that really exist rather than making up patterns based on our theoretical orientation. So the outcome goal then links with the second piece, which is a process goal. Process goal is when you are able to break down to say some specific things that you can work on that actually has leverage to give you that fulcrum and the leverage to move what's necessary in terms of the, the goal that you have. So for example, in, in chapter two, we talk about a practitioner by the name of Janice that we called her there. And she, she was looking through her data and she found ultimately after through a lot of non-linear process, by the way, it's not so straightforward, but she finally realized that there was something quite uh, a glaring in her data when, when she started to comb through. And one of the things was she found that a lot of people actually starts to started to to drop out of treatment moving from inpatient to outpatient after she saw them first time in inpatient and it was kind of illuminating for her because many of them don't move to see her outside of the of the inpatient setting so her plan was trying to revolve around how to engage them from the get go as opposed to just treating it as like an assessment uh, at that point and then once we get that so once we know what the outcome goal and the process goal is, then you want to build a garden of learning to feed, to help you take knowledge from, from anywhere, from psychotherapy books, the research literature, to movies that you've watched, to other seemingly irrelevant professions that you might learn some stuff to bake it into your work. And the learning project could, could last maybe a few months for some people even, but you grow this and some things you prune away as well. And then you could see what comes out of there, sometimes even unexpected. But the, the idea is like what Richard Feynman, the famous physicist would say, you know, have a great question and always have it placed at the back of your mind. Ultimately, you want to link your outcome and process and learning project in a synergistic fashion. And I, I think that this is a picture that's become more clear to us as people have tried to apply the principles first identified in the book Better Results, that deliberate practice was not simply being told one skill to do over and over again, but involved this was what was part of that actually was distilling your outcomes to a single objective, trying to figure out what had leverage on bringing about that outcomes, and then creating this entire project of learning that supported the process goals that you had that ultimately would lead to the outcome objective that you were looking at, whatever that might be in the case of Janice, that is helping people maintain their connection with the therapist when they move from inpatient to outpatient. These are the basic core elements of a deliberate practice approach. And Daryl and I were thinking that we would take this first half hour and introduce them. And Daryl, I see that our timing is about right. We're mm -hmm. right up at one half hour, and then we would take some time to open up the floor and address any questions or comments that people have, and they can do that in a couple of ways. Yeah, so I know some of you have also sent in the questions already. Thank you so much for, for doing that. We'll do our best to cover grounds on, and, and on themes that we are noticing that's, that's there. Meanwhile, one way you could do this at this point is in your chat in Zoom, we encourage you to just type it in and just feel in all the questions you might have. Think aloud with us. We may not be able to cover all of them, but what we will do is this. As we have the questions in there, uh, let's say Scott is responding, I will keep an eye on the questions and then feel the, the next one as well. Let's scroll through the questions. One is the publication date for the field guide right now as you speak in fact i was up early this morning doing some final edits and such daryl is working crazy to finish the last chapter for for the book right now we are sending that to the publisher at the end of this month so may 31st it goes to the publisher which yeah. is the american psychological association press they usually take about six months to both review and turn the manuscript around so we're expecting sometime in 2023 the the book will be made available so scott there's, there's one question i'm lumping it all together and that's because the, there were questions from the from the emails and from the zoom registration as well and the question revolves around uh, organizations and implementing fluid practice to the work so a lot of the questions revolve around 
Uh, for example, uh, Valerie from Canada was asking how to implement dildo practice into the clinical team. Dan Stokeman from US was asking about how to motivate other people to, to engage in dildo practice. So there were a couple of that who were asking. Okay. I, and I saw this question from Ricky Addis as well. You can scroll up if you want. Hi, Ricky. Glad you're here with us about a program that sees increased violence incidents among clients during certain times a year. Can a team do deliberate practice? The answer to that is, of course, yes. However, since so much of deliberate practice is aimed at individual performers in an agency context, what I would want to make sure we do is have the assessment of each individual therapist who's contributing. Because oftentimes things like violent acts are nested within a particular therapist or a program within the agency. And the more divorced they become from the context that gives rise to them, that context being maybe individual work with an individual clinician, the harder those problems are to resolve via a deliberate practice effort. So first off, there may be rumors that more violent instances occur during certain times a year. I'd have to measure this and get a consistent picture. I'd have to see which, which clinicians are involved, which programs are involved, and then we can determine what kind of deliberate practice activities we and what factors we might leverage in the service of improving that outcome. David Gortner asked, Daryl, can you give a specific example of the three-step process, particularly the learning mode? Yeah, so one of the learning projects that was vivid on my mind was, I'm speaking now as a clinician when, when you know, I noticed that at one time point, my, my data was starting to suffer with a group of people. And then I started to look at not just the name, uh, the, the numbers of the scores, but I was trying to figure out who they were. And one of the patterns that came up with this group that were, were not reaping good outcomes was that, strange as it sounds, and I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed to say this, but there was, there was no clarity on goal consensus. And this sort of hit me because this is a literature that I know very well that all consensus, though the studies are far, far fewer than studying about treatment modalities and its differences, goal consensus have a high impact on outcome. And when there's a lack of goal consensus, things don't go well. Now, some of you might not like the word goals, right? You could think about this in terms of effective focus. You could think about this in terms of directionality of where the boat's sailing. This is all critical because if a clinician has an idea of where things should go that is not in line with the client, you're going to have a lot of yes buts, right? So that's how I started this learning project when I saw the patterns. And the thing I was trying to do was to figure out a couple of things to figure out how to language what we should focus on, not just one session at a time, but thematically over sessions. What are some things that I can be asking as well, instead of just uh, narrowly focusing on say solutions, if I'm coming from a solution focus oriented approach, because the solution focus approach is asking about exceptions, right? Or what has been better, but to focus on goals means that you need to hear where a person's having inner struggles, things that's going on in their lives, and to be able to zoom in on that. So I was taking in inputs from uh, uh, business books that I was reading about how they set up agendas. So a, a strangely great book was, I think her name was Priya, Priya Parker. I think it was The Art of Gathering. And, and she talked a lot about how a lot of meetings were wasting people's time, right? And she talked about setting a sen sense of intentions, really imp important. And so on. So I was going through all different things. I was reading through my past notes because I, I keep notes of what I'm learning weekly. And I was just trying to piece together. And what I did basically was just an A4 size paper with a mind map and just many notes coming out. And what, I'm, what I was trying to do was not learn what to say, but I was trying to organize my mind with a shortcut that would anchor me with principles. So the learning projects was really creating this kind of mental representations to chunk with principles so that when I'm engaged with people 
uh, these are really readily available to me, a bit like the map that Scott was mentioning. We, we talked a bit more about this in the, the practice web-based workshop, specifically this particular scenario. Here's another example. We noticed very early on, quite accidentally, that therapists who had lower initial SRS scores, alliance scores, had better outcomes in the end. I'd been gathering data about my use of the SRS for close to 10 years when this result was first published. And I had an average SRS of about 38. The top performing therapists, those with the best outcomes, had SRS scores between a 34 and a 36. The question was, how do you lower your SRS scores? And that would have leverage on improving my outcomes or my effectiveness, which was my outcome goal. So I was going to try to figure out how to create an environment where clients could speak up and speak out. That was my process goal. The learning project for me included two things. First, I started interviewing top performers. Many of you have seen the video that I did with Wendy Amy, who was one of our signal first super shrinks without telling her what I was looking for, but asking her lots of detail about how she ended the session and how she talked about the SRS. Interestingly, Daryl, you mentioned the business literature. I also found a lovely book published by the Gallup Foundation called Human Sigma. Human Sigma, and in that book, they spent several chapters talking about how businesses who manage to solicit more negative information from their customers, especially around breaches in the customer business relationship, actually had more enduring customers and greater sales. Two full chapters that had tons of references in it that I then tracked down. And eventually that translated into different ways to talk with the client before I administer the measure, and especially different kinds of questions for processing the feedback that they would give me. And in the end, my SRS scores began to drift down over, over time. And interestingly enough, there was a small leverage on my performance at about the year to year and three quarters mark in, in, my, in my results. I noticed that somebody also asked Daryl about apps for administering the measures. Thanks for that particular question. Let me just show you that on my personal website, if you scroll down to where it says fit software tools and click on that, it will take you to a page that, that describes the systems for gathering data, administering the measures and aggregating the data about your individual performance. And this is also how we can identify, as we said earlier, our very specific outcome objectives that we might have. We could find that we have a high dropout rate, a problem with somebody who presents in a particular way or with a particular problem. Those would then become the subject of this process Daryl describes as OPL. Ricky Addis, I think, Sacramento, California. And the question is, do do you ever experience situations where no matter how much a DP or clinician engage in, the outcomes do not improve? And what do you do then? Hmm. I guess this is related to her first question as well in an agency setting. So let me just hmm. say DP is, as I said earlier, a hot topic. But personally and ethically, I do not believe managers have the right to ask clinicians to engage in DP. In other words, I don't believe they have the right to ask clinicians to do anything more than simply meet benchmarks for a good quality standard of care. So we have to know what those benchmarks are. And in the systems that we use, the fit outcome systems that we use, that benchmark is clearly spelled out. If an individual clinician wants to say, I want to improve, then I'm all for that. And it would be great if the agency supported them in that particular effort. But to ask clinicians to do more than, than what everybody else is doing, I just, I just have a moral quandary uh, about, about that and think that's, they think that's very troubling. Now back to Ricky's question. I don't know if you have thoughts about it, Daryl. No, I mean, whenever you say this, because I'm familiar with you saying this whenever we run the workshops and often behind the scenes when we're taking a break, therapists come and say, did he just say that? 
like like the scholar actually to say that you know we shouldn't be pushing people to that and i think that's fairly interesting so can you say a bit more about you the moral quandary the, the dilemma you have about this kind of insistence or pushing people even further from a top-down management perspective It'd be very different if management and clinical staff work together in the way that Ricky asked in her original question, that everybody realizes that certain clients around a particular time seem to have yeah. a higher incidence of violence. There's some, everybody has a stake in that, everybody, yeah. right? And we all decide we're going to work together to see if we can't resolve that particular issue and concern. Even there, there's some tricky questions, I believe. But for management to decide that you have to work harder, because that's another thing we haven't mentioned, deliberate practice is a shitload of extra work for very slow and who knows, Ricky, sometimes no apparent progress despite massive amounts of effort. And the question, of course, in the case of that is, well, were we aiming at the right deliberate practice objectives? Mm -hmm. Does this actually have leverage? And what time span are we talking about? Because you are not likely to see improvements in your outcomes or your outcome goal in the short run. And I like to think of it using an analogy of an Olympic athlete. Therapist outcomes are on par with coronary artery bypass surgery on average. So they're already doing really well. Now to move your performance a little bit to push your performance a little higher. It's like an Olympic athlete. You're thinking of shaving off milliseconds and millimeters, not meters and minutes. This is gonna be very slow progress because the bar is very high. And I think that's why Erickson said, with naive and purposeful practice, hold on, most people give up because proficiency is all the system really requires. And proficiency is all the system, in my opinion, can ask for. I'm doing my job, but I don't have to be better at it because you said, at least not unless there's a joint work project, we want to resolve this problem of violence at, at, during the holiday season, yeah. then maybe. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And you know, the, the, the thing that for me, when, when I'm thinking about this, there's, there's a slight paradox at play because the overemphasis on performance can actually impede the possibility of deep learning. And what you want to encourage is a learning system within an organization, right? Where people are coming collectively to learn. And if there are blunders, it's not hideaway, it's shared, it's talked about and generalized to other people and see what they can learn. And one, one comparison I like to make is when you compare the aviation industry with the healthcare system in general. The aviation industry, if there is an accident, the black box, which is not black, is orange, but there are two oranges or two black box in the plane that allows the, the, the signals of audio as well as other kinds of signals that are going around the plane for the whole industry to learn when something happens, right? Whereas a healthcare system, when an error or blunder happens, we make sure the paperwork's done properly. We make sure our ass is covered. There's no liability issues and so on. So I think creating a learning system is the thing that helps to cultivate further. But if you overemphasize and trying to perform, it can actually impede any kind of learning. Someone was asking, Scott, is that interview with the Amy available online? Some of those interviews are available in our, on the YouTube channel, the ICCE YouTube channel. So if you simply search my name, then you'll be able to, to find the ICCE YouTube channel. And there are portions of interviews with Wendy Amy there. Somebody says that time and resources are often limited to put DP in, into practice. And it, it, here's here's a little interesting tidbit that Daryl and I found in the live workshops that we surveyed people. And I think maybe we replicated this even in the asynchronous course, which by the way, is coming up again in June. This is a course that's made up of a series of 
content, a bit of content that is dripped to you on a weekly or every other week basis, videos, and then a live workspace to talk with others that are involved in, in the course. It's meant to be designed in a way that you can learn at your own pace. Plus you have lifetime access to, to the materials and any updates that come with that. It's not a subscription model where you have to pay every month. So we, I personally I struggle with subscription stuff. So we wanted this to be a little bit more easy peasy for, for everybody. Scott and I will be with you at each step of the way. And there'll be discussions that's going on as well. And we'll jump in and we it's both content and community. But what we found was this people, if they were given time at their agency to do DP, they spent about X number of minutes per week engaged in DP. If the agency didn't give you time, they spent the same X number of minutes on their own doing it. So in other words, waiting for the boss to give you time is not, it doesn't seem like the causal variable involved in whether or not people do it, since the amount of time is the same. And most of this, if you're interested in improving, is going to take far longer than you thought and probably needs to be done before work, after work, it's on the weekends, et cetera. I'm looking at Lila's question here. She asks about what happens if clinicians are not meeting basic benchmarks? And yes, then I think deliberate practice can be a way for folks to raise their performance level. Here's what we know doesn't work, sending them to a continuing education workshop and giving them supervision. Supervision at least in general, contributes, well, they've, they've, this is a study I've been involved with that's now been replicated. It's one of a handful that has had the privilege of being replicated by other researchers. It just doesn't contribute much to outcome. It, in fact, I'm, I'm hedging here. It contributes nothing that we can find to client outcomes. Targeted supervision via deliberate practice, we have some preliminary evidence that this does make a difference over, over time. We have another one. Dr. Z says, how do we separate out response bias, client desirability reporting and the ORS SRS ratings? Clients might say the session went well, but that might not really relate to what it did in terms of process goals. So in terms of fit practice, the principle here is going, I always take my clients statements on the measures at face value. For example, if a client scores very high on the ORS, which is our outcome rating scale, indicative of the client saying, I'm doing fine, I'm not going to push this client to tell me the truth. And the reason is, why wouldn't that engender response bias just as much as anything else? So instead, I act accordingly with a client who scores very high on the ORS, I'm going to say, help me understand what brought you here because it looks like things are going very well. That's what flows naturally. And it also maintains the relationship. I'm hearing what the client is telling me. Let's take the SRS, the session rating scale. If the client scores very high, since I know that lower scores are associated with better outcomes at, at the end of treatment, I'm gonna be asking myself, what did I miss in the creation of this culture of feedback? How did I explain the tool and how do I process this high score? I think I'm living proof that high scores can be reduced by deliberate practice, spending time introducing the measure. So this is the number one mistake, by the way, with the SRS, abbreviating the amount of time you spent introducing it. Do what Wendy Amy did. Here's what I learned from Wendy Amy. I, I now say to my clients, look, I'm not interested in perfect scores. Tens out of tens don't mean much to me. Uh, life's not perfect and neither am I. Think of me like your local tailor. If it doesn't fit, it's better to tell me so that I can make an adjustment so that it fits better for you. I will not be happy simply because you don't complain. And I also add, small is just as valid as big. So don't wait for a big complaint. Tiny things that are that you are almost willing to forgive me, don't forgive me, tell me. These are all things that I've learned from watching these top performers and interviewing Wendy Amy.
Mm. I hope that helps a bit, Dr. Z. And Scott, let me just jump in also for, for what you're saying about the SRS. For me, one common practice I do when administering the SRS is on top of what you just said, I also do a little bit of a rate and predict exercise in my mind. So that means that when the person scoring the SRS, so for those of you who have not seen the session rating scale form, it is not just about how good they feel about the relationship, it's about how much they feel understood. That's one piece. The focus of the session, whether is it according to what they want to talk about, second, and then the method, the approach of the session and overall how does it sit, right? So as this client is doing that, I'm also scoring based on my gut sense of how I think they experience the session. So this is a bit, this is a bit more of just a prediction of what I think they, they are scoring. So the idea is not for me to seek to be confirmed. The idea is to seek for me to be disconfirmed because once you have dissonance in your head, you, you'll be hungry to want to close that gap. So for example, if the person, I'm thinking of one case where the person scored f like 40, right? Full marks on that. But then I said, Hey, you know, I put there actually today, yeah, the relationship was about a nine, but then the goals and the approach for me, uh, it felt like a seven and a six. Actually, I didn't quite, I didn't think that what we that the way that we were dealing with this issue that you have with your partner, I didn't quite nailed it. I don't know what it is yet, but that's how I saw it. And interestingly enough, the client said, well, actually that's the case. <laughs> and said that in agreement that that was the thought, but this is not, doesn't happen all the time, but once that kind of mismatch happens, I want to fill in the gap. And to me, that's where the beauty of something like the SRS is. It's, it's not just the measurement, it's the conversation that comes with that because it's not an assessment tool. It's a conversational tool and it allows you to take in little gaps that you might have taken for granted. And then when they give you that piece, that's where you, you note it down, you note it down on what they're saying. And then how does this connect with deliberate practice? F for me, I see this, imagine two Venn diagrams, but they are only slightly overlapping. What I mean by that is this feedback that I get from this person is probably going to help me to adapt and be responsive to this particular person. I want to be careful that it's not necessarily generalizable to, to everyone, right? Until you see a pattern with your data, then that's where something pops up. And then you go, hang on a second. This is more than just one person thing. It's a pattern. Mm. And maybe we should just mention briefly that this yeah. pattern piece is what we then identify our outcome goal from. Once we identify that outcome goal, then we work backwards to figure out the how we're going to achieve that or our yeah. process objective. Then we create a learning project around that entire endeavor. And that OPL framework can be helpful, especially when you have your data, you have the TDPA, the taxonomy, and you're trying to understand what are my next steps. Put those two things together. Outcome goal leads to the TDPA, which can help you set the process objective, identify one small thing, and then begin to open your eyes, open your mind to any possible influence that might help you learn more about how to achieve that process objective. We want to thank all of you for joining us for this last hour. Thanks, Daryl, for staying up through the night. And thanks to all of you for being part thanks. of this. Yeah, thanks to everyone for joining us and for those of you who are watching this later on too. If I search, will I find